Section 3, regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. We'll start with a roll call by the Town Clerk. Chairman Lynch? Present. Councilor Backer? Here. Councilor Fritz? Here. Councilor McGinty? Here. Councilor Moles? Here. Councilor Roberts? Present. Councilor Swift-Chiata? Here. Student Representative Skylar Armstrong? Here. Student Representative Brianne Flynn? And Manager McGovern? Clerk? Okay, the next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance. The Pledge of Allegiance of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. The next item on our agenda is reports and correspondence, but before we go to that, I just do want to um, note the attendance of our high school representative, Skylar Armstrong, who is elected to represent the young people of the town, and um, Brianne Flynn is also a representative, and I understand will be here late because she has a tryout, so we welcome both of you and look forward to your participation this year. Are there any reports by the council? Kara. Yes, um, just wanted to remind people that the appointments committee will be considering applications uh, for boards and commissions, uh, the term starting in January, um, and usually for three years on, on these boards and commissions. Um, the deadline for applications is October 27th and applications can be obtained both through the town, um, through Deborah Lane and at the website. Um, the positions that we're looking to fill are on the Arts Commission, several positions, um, the Board of Assessment Review, Community Services, Fort Williams, and Personnel Appeal in the Thomas Memorial Library. Um, so get your applications in. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Mould? Yeah, I, I just, I thought Carol would have mentioned it, uh, but I think that everyone should know that we do have four people running for school board in the upcoming election, and the League of Women Voters is going to be having a candidates night on Thursday night the 30th, so everyone should tune in for that. Uh, also on Next Monday night, the 27th, there will be a public forum here at the Town Hall to talk about the casino yes versus the casino no issue. So I hope people will tune into that as well. Thank you. Are there any other reports or correspondence? Okay. Just a reminder that the uh, state re referendum and the special municipal election is Tuesday, November 4th at the high school gymnasium. The polls are open 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Absentee ballots are now available at the town clerk's office during regular office hours. We will have staff in the council chambers the last week of October to do more absentee balloting. Um, if anyone cannot come into town hall to vote, I'll be glad. Give me a call, and I'll be glad to mail you a ballot. Thank you, Jackie. And now um, we'll have a report of the town manager, and in particular, the town manager will be pro providing us with a report on the first quarter and I guess the end of last year as well. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, before I did that, I did want to clarify the Councillor, really, Tom, can you put that up there? A little bit. Yeah. Councillor Moles mentioned there's going to be a forum on the casino issue, yes or no, and I just wanted to clarify that we do have forums here at the town office in the town hall that are sometimes not sponsored by the town. And this is a case that is sponsored by a private organization and not by the town. I'd, I'd encourage everyone to come and to hear about the issue, but uh, it is not a town-sponsored forum. So, thank you. This, this is Tinny. Better this way. Anyway. Uh, Michael, are you doing slides up here? I am. Okay, I'll like move. Both? Yeah, Jackie probably ought to relocate, too. As, as Mary Ann... Uh, Something else is computer, not laptop. Thank you. Uh, 
As Marianne mentioned, the uh, town audit is nearly complete. All the numbers are in. It's just a matter of getting the final printed copy. Uh, by the way, it now runs about 114 pages. Uh, from uh, used to run about 25, so uh, it, it is quite a project now. Uh, we've also looked at our first quarter revenues and expenditures, and I also was asked uh, by the finance chairman if we could look at some of the impacts of the tax reform issues that are going to be on the ballot uh, the first Tuesday in November, as well as the impact of the various uh, school referenda. What happens when I... Yeah, could you do that? One thing, it, it's really important, the audit gives us a chance, is to look at where we are historically in terms of where different spending is occurring. And the word that most of us can't see behind the light up there is audited spending. These aren't budget numbers, these are actual audited spending amounts. And for all of this, I began in the year 2000, figuring that's a good time to start. And as you look at this, uh, probably most important to start at the bottom. Uh, capital improvements during that period, this includes a, a whole gamut of capital improvements, not only current spending that year, but prior years, that's down 25%. The debt that you see here is municipal debt only. Uh, it does not include school debt. And in fiscal year 2002, which ended on June 30th, 2002, the town spent $490,000. Uh, this past year it was $1.1 uh, $1 million, you know, really a substantial difference. The other major thing we're seeing is an increase in intergovernmental expenses. And obviously that relates predominantly to Cumberland County, and that's an increase of $241,000 in just that short period. Uh, education is 14% uh, over that period. And if you look at municipal alone, you know, excluding education, it was 12.2% to give you a, a sense of really how close those are. Uh, library and parks, it looks like a big increase, 185,000. Uh, that's predominantly due to the swimming pool, and you'll see another slide that, that shows that. Uh, public safety actually spent, this would be police, fire, the wet team, they actually spent 1% less than was spent in 2000. In general government, which also includes employee benefits, health insurance, which went way up, despite that, that only over the course of this period only went up a total of uh, 4%. Uh, this, this is just a, a graphical depiction of the same thing. Uh, this is a percentage expense changes, and you can again see public safety with the decrease and, and the other changes. Major areas of change picked out a few areas that we generally hear about a lot. We're curious, we, we often hear special ed is, is going up quite, quite a bit of, quite a bit. You can see it's been 27% in just that very brief period or almost $400,000. Regional waste systems, 40%. But the real scary, scary part about regional waste systems is they're not paying their debt off. Uh, they opened that plant with a debt of, of about 70 million and the last I saw, the debt is now over 100 million. And, you know, that is scary in terms of, you know, that number is, is really likely to increase quite a bit. Uh, the actual county tax that was paid went up 46%. The pool, my guess is, you, so do you remember when the pool opened actually? Yeah, January of 2000. So what you see there is that that's only a, a really partial year expense in the year, the fiscal year 2000. And by fiscal 2004, that, that had gone up 148,000. Well, it is offset, though, quite a bit by revenue. I should mention that. Again, town debt service. You know, where is the money being spent? Uh, over from the year 2000 to 2004, it went up $646,000 on the budget. Uh, that is, you know, what paid for all the different facilities. But you, you look back at those other numbers, and because of that, in large respect, a, a lot of other things were held back. Uh, you know, nothing really met the inflation, and, and particularly on the municipal, you know, that, that felt the brunt a lot of it, where the increases were, if you look back at those percentages, they tended to be in the intergovernmental piece, uh, the regional waste systems, the county government, 
uh, as well as obviously in debt service. During the same period, school debt service has increased, has decreased about 15 percent. Look at revenues. I'll go over this sheet real quick. I think we all can guess what that top line is. That's the property taxes. Uh, the next line down, which is a light blue, you can barely see it, uh, is intergovernmental, but you can see the trend is down. And then all the other revenues that the, the town gets pale in comparison uh, to those, uh, those two major ones. <coughs> the trend over the last few years is that m more and more of spending within Cape Elizabeth is coming from Cape Elizabeth and from the property tax. Uh, the property tax income has gone up 22% in this period. And I emphasize income because some of that growth is because of new construction, uh, new additions, uh, that type of thing. Uh, we, we recently looked at the most recent year, and of the additional amount from the property tax, half was from a tax increase and half was from new construction. But 22% is of concern. To skip down about three lines there, intergovernmental revenue. This would be the state education subsidy, state revenue sharing, a little bit of uh, highway money, down almost a million dollars since uh, fiscal year 2000. And investment income is down 72%, not surprisingly, or 166,000. So you can, you can really see that shift into the property tax. You can see it as well. Uh, this, this graphically, again, with a bar graph, pick that. You look at this next sheet. Property tax in fiscal year 2000 funded 67% of the general fund expenditures. The most recent year, the property tax funded 74% of general fund expenditures. Other taxes stayed about the same, licensing and permits are a percent. Investment now registers as a zero percent when it's rounded. Now that used to fund three or four percent. Uh, Intergovernmental revenue has gone down from funding 20 cents on the dollar down to 15 cents on the dollar. And there's you know, every reason to anticipate that, that uh, depending on certain other votes, that that is likely to continue. How are we doing with our surplus? Uh, the, the council, as long as I can remember, has always debated what the surplus of the town ought to be. Should it be a month's worth of expenditures? Should it be a percentage of the tax commitment? Uh, this demonstrates a 10% of the tax commitment. Uh, the tax commitment in 2000 was 13 million 620,000. Uh, in 2003, it was 16 million 610,000, give or take a few dollars. As you can see, the undesignated surplus near 2000 met 93% of the target, went down to 91 in 2001. It is now down to 69%. You might say $1.1 million, isn't that an awful lot of money to have as an undesignated surplus? But then you look at when the entire municipal budget is $25 million. Uh, and there's other funds, for example, the sewer fund uh, at the time, June 30th, had a fund balance of about 60,000 and over 270,000 in receivables. Just that fund alone ate 210,000 of this undesignated surplus in, uh, in terms of cash flow. So that is really at this point what I'd call a historically low level as a percentage of the tax commitment. There is some better news, uh, been a little depressing up to this point. When the revaluation was completed, Everyone says, don't you get more money out of the revaluation? And you know, as most taxpayers saw, that the tax bills do go down. But after the revaluation was completed, the council received a report from the assessor. And if you look at the entire budget of what was adopted by the town council last May, and you look at the ultimate valuations that everyone got tax bills for, there was a difference of $430,000 which would, what is called an overlay that is still available for the assessor in order to uh, make property tax abatements to address issues that someone might have with values. These are, these are real dollars at tax at the rate of $14.20 per thousand. The, the actual amount was about 430000 Some of that is still being whittled away, but it is helping, uh, can potentially help to bring that surplus back to 
to uh, closer to at least the 90% level as opposed to the 70% or below. Uh, the town is also looking at lot sales, looking at the lot next door, uh, as well as the Conservation Commission is looking at a number of other lots as well, and those, uh, if sold, should help with revenue. Hmm. But other revenues, uh, municipal revenues, investment income, miscellaneous income, excise tax, uh, state revenue sharing, this is just a municipal only. Those are currently uh, projected at year end next June 30 to come in a net of 80,000 under budget, which causes a bit of a challenge in terms of, uh, you know, that money needs to be made up for somehow. It, uh, it remains, that does remain a challenge. Everyone understand the basic concept so far? Any technical questions? Okay. Mike, could you explain the overlay one more time? I'll give that a try. Uh, when the council adopts a budget, it says, and, and I'll use for demonstration purposes, I won't use exact numbers, we need $17 million from the property tax and $8 million from other sources. When that, those preparations, that was all done, we were uncertain how much the value of the town would ultimately be. The value of the town came in at $1,275,000. When you multiply that by the tax rate of $14.20, instead of generating the $17 million that was needed, it generated $17,430,000. Okay? What's going on with the state school subsidy? Uh, in year 2000, it was right, and these, these are rounded off, about 2.5 million. The year that just ended was about 2 million. This year's budget's about 1.8 million. And if 1C passes, which is one of the options on the ballot on November 4th, uh, or if there had been no issues on the ballot, uh, the projection that the State Department of Education is now putting out shows that we're at 1.1. One of the challenges we have is that for the last five, six years, uh, <coughs> we've been funded with something called the cushion. If you impute the formula, you, you fig compute it, you figure it all out. You know, we should have received this past year an amount that was probably closer to 1.3 million than 1.8 million. But our legislators and legislators from similarly impacted places across the state tried to close that gap and the legislature fund, funded something called a cushion. Uh, without that cushion next year, the gap is over $700,000. Uh, particularly with much tighter revenue, unless there is a major change in how schools are funded in the state of Maine, uh, that will be down to uh, a 1.1 million from just 2.5 million at the turn of the millennium. So quite a drastic change, particularly when you look at it percentage-wise. Uh, there are a number of issues on the ballot. Uh, question 1A, which is that that was put forward by 100,000 citizens who signed a petition, called for 55% of the cost of education statewide to be funded by the state government, fulfilling a commitment that was made uh, back in the 1980s. Uh, instead of Cape Elizabeth getting one million, under the estimates from the Maine Municipal Association, it'd be closer to 4.2 million. That is because of the changes in, that are in that bill in terms of how you define education, and particularly because of the funding of special education <coughs> that's proposed uh, in question 1A. Question 1B, which is the competing proposal, the one put forward by the, the governor and the legislature, uh, under that proposal, you know, that's being talked about as property tax relief and that we've seen those television ads, lo and behold, you look at the real numbers, mm -hmm. Cape Elizabeth dropped from about 1.8 million down to uh, a little over a million dollars. So, you know, anyone that looks at those ads needs to understand uh, that, that it is not, as in 1A even, it's not equally across the board, that it's still, you do have formulas, you do have uh, certain uh, categorical funds that, that are promised for different reasons, but under 1B, uh, Cape Elizabeth clearly uh, 
as a school program uh, suffers. Again, it's a $3.1 million difference in if question A is approved. Under question B, however, the homestead exemption is reinstated. The circuit breaker program is at enhanced. But even with the homestead exemption, we're looking at a few hundred thousand dollars, whereas the uh, 1A proposal uh, means over $3 million more for Cape Elizabeth. If 1C, the none of the above, uh, that would reduce the, occur the current amount the Cape Elizabeth taxpayers and school children receive by over $700,000. Again, $2.5 million down to a uh, million just since the year 2000. There's a lot of questions about the school referendum and what that's going to cost and the impact of that. Uh, the kindergarten proposed to be the cost of it implemented over two years. Uh, to the average taxpayer, that's someone with a $270,000 value home roughly. 293. Thank you. 293 is $35. The high school would be uh, $176 over three years for a total of 211. <coughs> over the three years, the breakdown shows that about a little less than half of it would be next year, or a little uh, less than half again in. Uh, the following year and then a small amount uh, in fiscal year 2007. So the big picture. Town revenues are continuing to trend down. Tax revenues, that amount that's coming from the local property tax, continue to trend up. I think everyone sees that when they write out their checks. Uh, our surplus is at a historic low. Uh, school subsidy, the picture doesn't look good, but it might change if 1A passed. And as you saw in the last slide, school projects, when approved, will add to taxes. You look at the big numbers. This is my best estimate of where we are on October 15, 2003, as we look toward a budget for July 1, uh, beginning July 1, 2004. The municipal budget next year would increase approximately 15 cents on the overall tax rate of $14.20. That takes into account a approximately 4% spending increase. Uh, we've negotiated 4% increases for the public works and police employees, plus trying to catch up a little bit on that 25% on the capital improvement decrease. But you see, in the big scheme of things, you know, 15 cents. You know, certainly is important to the municipal budget, uh, but you know it's a challenge. The school budget, that is not intended to imply any policy or whatever, but if you strictly look at the spending piece of the school budget, <coughs> and you look at what the historical increases have been on the expenditure side, that would be approximately 36 cents. If the, as you saw before, if the two projects passed, both kindergarten and high school, next year that would add about 32 cents. School other revenues. If you look at the school budget, one of the challenges in the school budget next year, in when when you see the audit, is that their undesignated surplus has also decreased quite a bit over the last few years. And there was a, an amount I think it was four hundred fifty thousand dollars was used in this year's budget to help support school budget. That is not sustainable over the long term. Uh, so that, just from dealing with the school department, probably not having as much money available from other revenues, use of surplus, that is, that is a, just that alone is an impact equivalent to the municipal budget. It's about a couple hundred thousand dollars. Uh, there's also some challenges with the school lunch program. I don't know how much the school board talked about it, but that's in a deficit situation and is going to need some, uh, some attention in, in terms of uh, its funding. Uh, the county tax increase, the county budget is up about 12%. The uh, tax increase in the county budget is up, uh, proposed on a county-wide basis, a little, over, uh, three, a little under 3%. I, I don't really know. It's too early to tell. It's early in their process, but, but it's negligible. It's about a penny. You add that together, that's 99 cents on the tax rate of $14.20 currently. If 1B or 1C are adopted by the citizens of the state of Maine, we would be impacted 54 cents in terms of a structural gap that would be created. 
that would bring that 99 cents up uh, to a dollar 53. 1A, the the proposal that was put forward by the 100,000 signatures uh, would relieve a, approximately a dollar 42 from the 99 cents, and the net reduction, if you look at all these structural issues as well as you know the little bit of inflation that's in there. Uh, if that passes, even though that seems like a big, big number, uh, it, it's a net of 53 cents if you, you look at the, the 99 cent problem that begins. And you know, it's important to look at this 99 cent problem. You know, 99 cents doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if, if you're looking at a, a uh, $290,000 home, that obviously is $290 uh, to give you a, a sense of the impact. Uh, is that the last slide? Yeah. <coughs> it is. Would you like me to have a chance? Yeah. Okay. I had a question, Mike. On the 3.7%, um, the, the ads that the on um, 1A are showing a 50, basically they say 15% right. reduction in property taxes. They're not making very clear that that's an average statewide. This 3.7% that we would receive is compared with 15% that they're advertising. You know, yes and no. You know, the 15 percent, one, is statewide, and two, it, it looks at everything else as being static, when in fact there are other issues that are going on at the same time. In our case, approximately $200,000 revenue problem on the school side, about 100000 revenue problem on the municipal side, plus a little bit of increased spending on either side, plus the... The, uh, you know, if we didn't have these school projects, you know, which, you know, uh, are up for approval, you know, that's, that's 32 cents. You could add that 32, uh, you know, if, you, if that wasn't there, that 3.7% would be, I don't know the exact amount off the top of my head, but that obviously would be a higher percent. The 15 is not statewide, but yet, it's, you know, it's a lot better if you look at the, the, buck, 50, the buck 53, now that's more than a 10% tax increase. Uh, so you know you, you not only have to look at the shift to the 3.7, you need to look that if if 1A doesn't pass, we're, we're, we're digging ourselves even deeper into a hole and exacerbating that problem of more and more of everything that goes on being funded by the property tax. Based on those numbers, clearly 1A is the option for the folks in this community. I, I was, was surprised to see quite an example, but I. My concern is I don't want people to be thinking that they're going to get 15% reduction in Cape Elizabeth in property taxes and then not see that realized with this, but the, uh, the numbers are good for us uh, compared to the other two options. But uh, so that's, that's the point I want to make, make sure people are aware, are aware of that. Do any, are there any other questions for Mike? Or comments? Councillor Swift-Tab. Thank you. Um, Mike, I want to thank you. That was a very um, concise yet informative review. Uh, I think it illustrates the uh, challenges that are facing us in, in uh, Cape Elizabeth just in terms of our upcoming budget. There are a lot of external forces at work that are um, going to be providing us with some challenges. Um, as far as the tax reform question goes, um, I, I appreciate what uh, Councilor Roberts said, but I think the choice is clear for Cape Elizabeth citizens who are su both supportive of education and who are also interested in property tax reform. Um, the choice basically is a cut of five to 700,000 next year for us with 1B, which is the governor's and the, the legislature's proposal, or 1C, which is the current situation, which is going to be pretty dismal for us, too. You can, we can have that, or we can get an increase of $2.6 million, $2.6 to $2.9 million with 1A. Um, I will be voting for 1A in November, personally, and I urge everyone else to also, because I think it will increase state support for Cape Elizabeth schools, as well as provide 
significant property tax reform for Cape citizens. Um, and I won't say any more than that, but uh, it is my intent that what, if indeed 1A were to pass, that it would be um, my intent that the money that would fall out of that, the net amount, and obviously if there's an emergency or something that comes up, that would have to be taken into account, but um, the net amount of whatever change we've got uh, would fall out to the property tax and go back to the property tax rate. Okay, Mark. Yes, thank you. Uh, I too will vote for 1A, but not quite for the same reasons. Uh, it's a short-term fix. What is not readily apparent is that the state will still have to come up with the 240 to 250 million dollars that it's going to be funding. But the state, unfortunately, does not have the self-control to bring themselves up to the 55% level that they promised to 15 years ago. And I hate to go to such extreme tactics because the true solution is to change the school funding formula because Cape Elizabeth, because of the high property values near the coast and the high income of its residents, is getting hit twice and very heavily. And that school funding formula over the next several years really needs to be changed. And that, that's the crux of the issue. But the short-term solution will be they'll bring it up to 55% statewide if 1A passes. We will get more money because there'll be more money in the pie. But the state legislature is, does not have the self-restraint to cut $250 million out of its other programs. So you can expect increases in income taxes and sales taxes to make up for that. And I'm, I'm not saying that that's, you know, the, the wrong way to go, but we need, we need to force this issue on the schools now because we can't afford to take the kind of a hit that is heading our way as we become a minimal uh, participant down to a 5% level on the school funding formula. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilor McGinty. Um, I can certainly say with a straight face that I will try to squeeze every dollar out of that return. I'm going to support 1A also, um, and short of an emergency, um, certainly I would be voting to return every cent that we possibly can to the taxpayer. Councilor Backer. Well, I'd just like to say that I agree with Councilor McGinty and Councilor swift Kayata um, in the sentiments um, that they've expressed with regard to their intent to return any um, increased um, savings that might be available to us uh, to the taxpayers resulting from any increase in funding uh, from the state, assuming that 1A passes. Um, I will also support uh, 1A. We all know there's no such thing as a free lunch. Um, if we have $240 million that has to come out of state revenues to fund the increase required to pay the school uh, expenses, the money's going to have to come from somewhere. And it's going to come out of our pocket one way or another, either through increased income taxes, sales taxes, use taxes, um, to the extent that Cape Elizabeth happens to be on the high end of the income uh, stream for the state of Maine, if there's an increase in income taxes, uh, residents of the, of the town of Cape Elizabeth may bear the brunt of that increase in income taxes if in fact that's what the legislature does. We don't know that that's what they'll do. Um, they may do a blend of cutting services, increasing sales taxes, um, increasing income taxes. There's a big cloud of unknown that hangs over it all. Uh, one way or another, we know we're going to have to pay for it. Um, how it's going to be dispersed is the big question mark. Um, but I will support 1A and we'll take it one year at a time and see where the tax burden is shifted. Um, but I think in the short term, Cape Elizabeth will certainly benefit from 1A and I'll do my best uh, to make sure that that savings is passed along. Uh, likewise, I. Um agree with Councillor swift Kayata and the Councillor McGinty on committing to pass on the savings. 
um, I'm perhaps a little more skeptical um, about the dire Chicken Little um, prospects of the 240 million when I reflect back on where the state budget was last January and the deficit was in ranges much higher than 240 million and yet that money was found without a tax increase um, in a multi-billion dollar state budget. Um, it's a question of priorities and I think for too long the state has not made fulfilling their 55% of the cost of local education a priority. So I too support um, 1A. I'm committed to um, using the money for property tax relief at the local level and um, I am less concerned about the so-called tax increase that the opponents of 1A and the proponents of 1B are crying about because in fact um, they've closed larger budget gaps in previous years without tax increases. So again, I, I think it's a question of priorities and hopefully 1A will make the state legislature realize that educating young people ought to be the priority. So I'll be supporting 1A and committing to um, property tax relief with that money. It's not a windfall um, for the municipality um, should we get it back. So. Okay. Next item on the agenda, and Michael, thank you. That was a great report. It's illuminating and once again very sobering. Um, the next item on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of our last three meetings, our regular meeting, September 8th. So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Seven zero. And the minutes of our special meeting on September 18th. So moved. Second. All in favor? And the minutes of our second special meeting on September 24th. So moved. Second. All in favor? <laughs> Moving right along here, okay. And it's, now it's that point in the agenda um, for citizens items, citizens discussion of items not on our agenda. So if anyone is here to talk about anything that we otherwise are not planning to talk about, um, now's an opportunity. And seeing none, we will go to the next item, which is a public hearing um, to provide for citizen comments on the upcoming school referendum to be voted on on November 4, 2003. Um, the law requires us to hold um, an opportunity for a public hearing uh, within a certain number of days. I think it's 60 days of the referendum election. 45? Thank you. So um, this is that public hearing, and I'll call the public hearing open. And when you come up, please state your name, address. Thank you. Um, my name's Mary Townsend, and I live at 5 Pearl Street. Um, on November 4th, I'll be voting yes to both school bonds, and I'd like to encourage other people to join me. My reasons are simple in that I feel that these bonds address real and immediate needs in our school system. The need for a Pond Cove addition is real and immediate. Because Pond Cove is too small for all of its students, our kindergarten has been located in the high school for over a decade. And like it or not, this has come at a cost. By isolating our town's youngest students and their teachers from the greater elementary school community, they've been denied easy access to the facilities and the services of Pond Cove. Even a visit to the library is considered a field trip, taking up valuable time for boots, coats, and bus travel. In addition, collaborative learning across grade levels is hindered by the separation. Next year, the high school will need to reclaim that space for its own students, but Pond Cove is still full. And every year, enrollment seems higher than expected. This year alone, there were 27 unanticipa 
unanticipated kindergarten students, and a new class was necessary. After a decade of waiting, there is still no space. I feel safe in saying that we have a long-term problem on our hands. And solutions like portables and shuffling class, sizes to the, or shuffling classes to the middle school or raising class sizes are short-term at best and at worst undermine the K-4 through education. The bottom line is that Pond Cove needs space now and in the future. A vote yes on the Pond Cove bond provides funds to build a permanent addition that guarantees all elementary students and their teachers a permanent place within the Pond Cove community. The need for our high school renovation is also real and immediate. I encourage voters who doubt this to take a tour. You'll see students sitting on the floor to eat their lunches because there's not enough space in our current cafeteria. On rainy days, you'll see a gym littered with trash cans collecting water from a leaking roof. I've heard in our computer lab, you'll see computers plugged into a massive extension cord because our classes lack adequate electrical outlets. And if you are a person with a physical disability, I feel that you will find our building is woefully inadequate for your needs. Approval of this referendum will address these and other building needs and create a safe and modern high school. And here's the good news. By making these critical investments in our schools now, our town can take advantage of still low interest rates and lower construction costs associated with a slow economy. These two projects combined would cost the average homeowner less than $18 a month, and that's less than a trip to the movies. Our school's real and immediate needs for ample space and quality conditions have been delayed long enough. These bonds are prudent investments designed to uphold our strong school system, a system by its reputation drew many of us to this community. I encourage everyone to support both bonds, not just for the integrity of our schools, but for the strength of our community as a whole. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Thank you. <coughs> and if there is no one else here, oh, there is. Great, it's good to hear from high school students. Um, my name is Skylar Armstrong, and I live on the East Avon Road and I'm the high school um, student town council representative. And in our current SAC, our, our last SAC meeting, we discussed the um, lack of space in our high school and our concern. And um, the SAC has a concern about the lack of space. Right now there are six um, class, science classrooms for seven teachers, which means that one teacher does not have a homeroom class. And there's also another foreign language teacher that does not have their own classroom. Um, three of the special education teachers do not um, have their own classrooms. Instead, their offices are located in old storage rooms. And this makes it extremely difficult and stressful for students to go back for extra help to find their teachers after school or just to like, converse with them about the last class or anything like that. And um, the SEC is extremely worried about this situation, and we plan to keep discussing it and trying to come up with some sort of suggestions or solutions. Thank you, Scarlett. Any further comments? I will declare this public hearing closed. And the next item on our agenda is a public hearing on the Fort Williams Master Plan. Okay. Um, I see Al Barthelman, the chairman of the Fort Williams Advisory Commission here. I understand, Al, you want to say a few words? I always like to speak. <laughs> um, yeah, I just thought I could make a few remarks uh, for the sake of discussion. Um, I, I've done this before with the uh, town council, but uh, I thought for the general public just to refresh their memory. I'm, I'm really impressed with the amount of uh, reading that the community has done in terms of getting the document and looking through it, it um, it's just amazing and it's wonderful. It shows it right off the bat, I think it's a living document that uh, people are showing a lot of interest in. Uh, I, I want to emphasize just a few things. First of all, this is an update to the 1990 plan. 
which really served its purpose very well, um, and, and it really supplements it. Uh, the purpose of a master plan like this is long-term direction, and I want to emphasize that because you know, you can tend to think that each item in there, we're going to try to do it this year, and that's not the case. Uh, there are a lot of thoughts in there uh, that hopefully will give direction over the next 10, 12 years, that type of thing. Um, it's really broken down. We have a map here if anyone wants to discuss it. Uh, it the, the plan itself is broken down into the idea that the park is a, a, a number of parks within the park. I think everybody has their own unique um, memories and experiences of the park. Um, the, the meadow looking down to the beach might be a place where somebody spent a lot of time with their children on the swings watching the ocean or up on Battery Knoll or the parade grounds playing ball, those type of things. I, one of the things we've really heard as the advisory commission is um, that the park is very special but also in very different ways to everybody. And our emphasis in this plan has been to try to come up with a plan which will maintain those special characteristics of those different areas o over many years to come, not to change things dramatically. Um, just a few highlights of the plan uh, for the sake of discussion. First of all, I, I think an important one is that we are not going to chase demand. We're not going to try to make things bigger because we have more traffic. Uh, an example is the beach parking lot, which is, is reconfigured to be safer because of the nearness to children and that type of thing. We would hope that it would have the same number of parking spaces um, in its future configuration as it has now. So that's an example of, of not trying to build um, to uh, increase demand. Another uh, topic in, in the plan is the Southwest Reserve, uh, which needs to be resolved, and that has been forwarded to the planning board. There's been discussion on that, uh, and that is uh, necessary in order to te really technically support the building of the new playground, which is going to be um, built up behind the day one, the, the uh, rental building up there. Um, sanitary facilities keeps getting talked about. It's the second most popular topic with some on the pond. <laughs> and uh, that is one of those things that we have to remember, we have to look into it, and that's one of the um, tasks that the advisory commission will uh, work on over this winter. I have a way to fund that, Al. I have a way to fund that. Do you? Uh oh. <laughs> a quarter? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, <clears throat> if you really look at the, uh, the plan, there's a whole lot of, of different recommendations uh, for uh, improvements and enhancements, like I said, primarily into keeping things as they are. Um, the advisory commission it has spent the summer uh, looking those over and prioritizing the things which are most important, and we will be uh, giving to the town council in the next, in the coming weeks, very soon, uh, a list of what we think are the top priorities. And interestingly, those top priorities are primarily of a, a maintenance nature. Um, top priority is to um, secure and stabilize the, the walls of the Goddard Mansion where the rocks are falling down. Um, the bleachers, um, where, where the concrete is, is peeling away. And Battery Garage, or Garage, depending on, on how you pronounce it, um, to clean that up. And so those are some examples of what we're seeing as top priorities, and they're really maintenance type uh, issues at this point. So I think that's about where we're at at this point, and, and we'll be uh, you know, looking constantly at that document for what are the top priorities in any time. Thank you. Al, thank you. And I want to take this opportunity to thank you and the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. Um, you're all dedicated volunteers. Um, I know we'll be discussing the merits of the plan in a few minutes, um, but you just all work so hard and care so much about that wonderful asset, which is truly one of the best assets in our town. And I was walking through the park today with a friend, and we both said that the reason we moved here was um, the, the parks and the open space, and it's just a treasure. And just please um, pass on our gratitude to the um, Citizens Committee, because we don't have time as a council um, to deal with coming up with a 10-year vision, and you all have just done a tremendous job over the years, so thank you, and thank you for this I, I'm, recent I'm, effort. Yeah, I'm honored to stand up here and represent them, too. It's, it's a tremendous commitment on everybody's part. Thank you.
Are there any other comments on the Fort Williams Park Master Plan? Oh, Marion, before you start, I want to make an important public announcement. All right. Okay, now we'll go back to business. <laughs> How are you going to talk that one? And we'll all be on tender hooks again tomorrow night. I'm going to be very boring after that <laughs> My name is Marion Guthrie, and I live at 108 Delano Park. I've lived there for 28 years, and um, our property abuts uh, Fort Williams Park. Madam Chairman and members of the Council. Thank you for the opportunity to comment on the new master plan and the proposed changes that Mr. Barthelman alluded to, uh, to section 19-6-8 of the zoning ordinance. I am fundamentally opposed to changing the zoning ordinance as it relates to passive uses in the Southern Preserve and relying solely on the master plan as the basis of its preservation. A master plan is a design. An ordinance is municipal law. Without the strength of an ordinance to preserve and protect this treasured land, my fear is that uh, the land will be vulnerable to development piece by piece by piece by well-meaning special interest groups who are willing to raise funds to develop and offer additional recreational activities in the park. The Southern Preserve, along with the Chapel Road Preserve, which should also be protected by an ordinance, are highly used, popular areas which provide users not only with variety, but also with a sense of peace, beauty, and solitude. <clears throat> I believe that the new master plan is excellent. It is sensitive to the history and finite nature of this very special park. Everyone associated with the project should be thanked and congratulated. And a special thank you to you, members of the council, for the time and energy you expend on behalf of the people of Cape Elizabeth. You sure have your challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. And um, just for the record, and we, Marion and I did discuss this before the meeting, there is no ordinance change before us tonight. It's just the master plan. But because there was some discussion of it, um, I thought that it would be in order for her to comment since she was here tonight. Are there any other comments from the public on the Fort Williams Master Plan? Seeing none, I will close this public hearing and move to the next item, which is consideration of the recommendation of the Planning Board that the proposed Fort Williams Master Plan be approved. So moved. Second. Is there any discussion? Councilor McGinty. How, how does that square with our current ordinance? I understand, I, I, my understanding is there's one issue here. It's, the, I think, the playground, or the, the proposed playground. It doesn't fit in with the current ordinance the way it's proposed in the master plan. I may, I may, may be mistaken, and I see our town planner here may be able to help me out on that. Um, I think that Mr. McGovern. Maybe I'll, I'll give it a stab. It's about Maureen. You know, I, I didn't hear Mrs. Guthrie specifically opposing the playground. She, she never said that. It's all to the approach by which it's handled. There, there was a, there's been a debate on whether or not uses ought to be referenced just as it needs to be in the comprehensive plan or in the, excuse me, in the master plan, and whatever's in the master plan is in essence the zoning, or in the case of the playground of just changing the line a little bit in the southwest preserve to accommodate the playground. It, it's a matter of approach. It doesn't really affect the master plan at all. I believe the master plan provides for playground in that area. 
it's the treatment of how it's handled within the ordinance that's been a real subject of debate uh, within the ordinance committee and uh, and otherwise. Well, can I follow up? Yes. I mean, is there a potential that we may have to change the ordinance to accommodate the master plan? What you think? There are a, you know a number of changes proposed in the ordinance text that is coming up later in the agenda. Uh, and you know the, the real, as it relates to the Fort Wayne piece of that, the, the real issue is do you, do you simply try to define the areas and what's allowed and what's not in, allowed in them, or do you say we rely on the master plan to do that? that that's the debate. And again, and that is in the ordinance piece. Michael, just to clarify, what's coming up later tonight is to set that for public hearing next month. So if there's no proposal that we act on any ordinances changes tonight. Any further discussion of the adoption of the Fort Williams Master Plan? Nope. I do have a further question. I'm sorry. Um, there are some numbers, some dollar numbers associated with some of the plans. Um, by adopting this master plan, we don't necessarily lock ourselves in those numbers. I mean, either higher or lower, those are just what the committee felt was a, a, a ballpark um, it's a wish number. List. Yeah, kind of a wish list. Okay. And it's a plan to guide <laughs> what their priorities are, but it will be subject to appropriation. Oh, I just want to verify that because those numbers do appear in the master plan. Councilor Ross. Were those figures not also to help with the Fort Williams Foundation as far as fundraising, perhaps to accommodate some of these projects? And that's a question. All right. Ask the town manager to. The answer is yes. It, it was hoped that some of these projects could be shared with interested citizens within the community and outside the community. And once you attach some numbers to them, specific priorities, that perhaps the Fort Williams Advisory Commission someone wanted to make available dollars uh, could recommend to the council that certain things be done. Thank you. Okay, I will uh, call for a vote then. All in favor of, uh, I guess we are approved, we are adopting the master plan for Fort Wayne. All in favor? And it is 7-0. Okay, the next item is consideration of a report from the Ordinance Committee recommending various amendments to town ordinances. Is there someone from the Ordinance Committee who would like to briefly? Well, there are three people from the Ordinance Committee <laughs> here, any one of whom would be equally capable of making the report. But um, luckily we have you as our chair right here, able to do it first. Well, I'll be happy to do that. Well, thanks to my co-committee members, Councilors Swift, Kayata, and McGinty. Um, this turned out to be a fairly easy task, despite sort of the enormity of the number of changes that we were looking at. Um, just as a brief summary, and recognizing that, that we're not presenting this for approval tonight, simply being recommended for public hearing, just a very quick run through of what some of the changes were by highlight. There were changes that we looked at and that are being recommended to the sewer ordinance, chapter 15, to the subdivision ordinance, chapter 16, um, the town way ordinance, chapter 17, and to the zoning ordinance, chapter 19. And many of the, well, first, sort of taking them in numerical order, Chapter 15, the sewer ordinance, the primary change there is to expand the opportunities for the town council to authorize extensions um, of the existing public sewers and the creation of what is attached to this packet and is now called a neighborhood sewer connection eligibility map. Um, and that's the primary recommendation uh, for the sewer ordinance. Under the subdivision ordinance in the town way, chapter 16 and 17, they are largely technical amendments recommended by the town engineer and or 
our director of public works. Um, and they include things like cleaning up conflicting language for consistency and clarity, um, changes uh, with regard to pavement width, um, placement of surveying pins, grading, subgrading, uh, paving, water drainage, and things of that nature. Nothing real exciting um, in those sections of the ordinance. With regard to zoning, there are a fair number of definitions that are added, uh, dealing with building height, um, increase in nonconformity, street frontage definitions. Um, there are changes made to the zoning ordinance to deal with the Perkins versus Town of Agunquit decision, which um, said that any change of dimensional standards needed to be done by the zoning board of appeals and needed to be done under either the undue hardship or practical difficulty standard. And there were a couple of places within the ordinance where the ordinance provided for the opportunity to change dimensional standards um, in ways other than through the Zoning Board of Appeals applying the practical difficulty or the undue hardship standard. So we tried to clean up a few of those. And that's basically it. There are a couple others. There are there is a proposed change to the affordable housing portion of the ordinance um, that provides specifications for uh, the order of construction that requires some proportionality in a developer building um, affordable housing in conjunction with the mar what we call market rate housing or the non-affordable housing, I guess, <laughs> which we seem to have a lot of in Cape Elizabeth. <laughs> um, and also provisions for requiring um, the advertising of the availability of affordable housing uh, when it's constructed. That is such a brief highlight without any details, but to give you just an idea of the scope of the various changes that's really all I'm intending to do at this point. The details are all in the text. Thank you, David. That's what I was hoping that someone would do. You did exactly that. And I think it's important for the public to be put on notice that um, these are all coming before us. And mm -hmm. what you're really recommending tonight is that we set this for public hearing next month. Yes. And I should add one more thing since we just talked about it. There is a proposal within the packet for the deletion from the zoning ordinance of the Southwest Preserve, the restrictions on the Southwest Preserve within Fort Williams Park, with the intention that the Southwest Preserve would be governed the same way the rest of the park usage is governed, and that is by the master plan. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? Is there a, is there a motion before us? Do you want to make a motion, please? Um, I uh, move that the that a public hearing be scheduled for Monday, November 10, 2003, uh, to consider the report from the Ordinance Committee recommending various amendments to chapters 16, 17, well, 15, 16, 17, and 19. Second. Uh, any further discussion, Councilor Fritz? Um, I. Certainly the description of the um, ordinance changes, I think, has to be brief, and, and you were brief, David, but um, I, I just have to express and, and urge people to read and look at the map. I don't know if the map is going to be available on the website and, and the wording of the changes on the website. My particular concern and, and hoping that people will read this so that they can come and comment at the public hearing is is on the sewer ordinance changes. I I think there could be some very extensive impact to this town if indeed this map were adopted um, and we encourage the changes 
the, it encouraged people to put in extensions of the sewer, uh, as is proposed here. Um, I mean, I'm thinking about what our comprehensive plan talks about, which is promoting orderly growth. I think this would be, could be, disorderly growth. Um, protecting our rural character, I think it could have a great impact on our rural character. Making efficient use of public services, this is all in our comprehensive plan, and preventing urban sprawl, um, I think this ordinance and this map um, could have a great deal of impact on how capable it looks, so I hope people will pay attention to it. Um, the map is, is, I think, pretty extraordinary in the amount of area that it's suggesting that we would cover the sewer. Um, I, I don't understand even the, the portions of the map that are selected or why some other portions are not selected. We don't even have extensions of the sewer going to these areas on the map. Um, some areas that are actually owned jointly by the town, the land trust, um, as open space are, are marked here as places that the sewer could be extended. Um, the two lights area, we don't have any sewer extension. So just the impact on our treatment plant capacity and whether we're going to um, increase the treatment plant and the expense of that. So I, I think this is a very big issue that, that I'm hoping citizens will comment on, look at the map, think about the implications for, for the public hearing at the next meeting. Thank you, Councilor Spencer. Are there any other further comments? All in favor? 7-0. Could I make a suggestion? I, mean, I know we have a yeah. public hearing next month. Um, the council may want to have a workshop after that. I mean, there's a lot of information here. Uh, if they have additional questions, we may consider after the public hearing having a workshop because I know for me, uh, Maureen, you know, had to do a show and tell a couple times to, for me to get it through my, my mind exactly what the words meant when you put it on a piece of paper. You know, that. So we might just consider that. I mean, it still seems appropriate to me to have the sewer ordinance proposal be talked about at a workshop so the whole council understands it before we put it to a public hearing before. That was going to be my response, John, is uh, I think a workshop is great, but personally I'd like to have it before the public hearing. So I have a better understanding of what the public may be talking about. No, that's fine with me. Yeah. If that's do we have it's fine with me well we can schedule that then later don't have much time so okay well why don't we make we can do that after this meeting the next item on our agenda is item 530304 consideration of a report from the ordinance committee recommending oh wait did we did we collapse did we just um, we didn't. Well, um, I'm sorry. We I thought we were doing 520304, uh, which we, is we, what we set for public hearing, but 530304. Oh, there's two. Uh, we we did 520304. Gotcha. And, and there are two items with the same number. Well, the, the, that the next, will confuse no, me. Don't the next one is 530304. Oh. Mm -hmm. The first number is 53. Okay. So we've set for public hearing. <coughs> the various amendments to the town ordinances, including those related to solid waste? No. No, no. we've just, no. We just okay. done 52. Then the next item is 530304, consideration of a report from the Ordinance Committee recommending amendments to Chapter 11, Article 2 of the Code of Ordinances relating to solid waste disposal. And I'm sorry, I was confusing sewer with Solid waste. Imagine that. <laughs> um, I'll move that we um, set the solid waste ordinance 
two public hearings on November 10th. Is there a second? Second. Okay, is there any discussion? Anything from Councillor Mould? Yes, I'd like to discuss this issue. This issue came before us back in June, and we were very clear, Councillor Roberts and I brought up the issue of the arsenic treated wood. And we were very clear that we wanted in this ordinance a way of handling arsenic treated wood other than just sloughing it off that they'd have to take it to another town. And then we find that when I got this in my package and I read every word of it, read it through very carefully, I was dismayed to find that, and I have a hard way, of, I'm trying to find a way to say this tactfully, but I was very disappointed in the way that arsenic treated wood was simply determined a hazardous waste, not mentioned again in the document, and then it was mentioned that we would not be taking any hazardous wastes at our transfer station. And when we have a town budget of $25 million that we can't take a couple of short pieces of pressure treated lumber to the town transfer site and have a way of dealing with them, I'm just appalled. And I'm appalled that this was not dealt with in the manner we had asked to before. So I am opposed to sending this to a public hearing until we have resolved this again, because I cannot support this, this ordinance. Okay. Thank you. Is there any further discussion? All in favor of sending it to public hearing? Six. All opposed? One. Six, one. I'd make the same comment about a workshop. If Mike thinks we need to dis discuss this at a workshop, I would, I would like to have it also. Maybe we could put those two That's issues together and get it out. So we'll schedule those after this meeting. Um, item 540304, consideration of the proposed renewal of a liquor license for the Perpudic Club. <coughs> and it's recommended by the staff that the application be approved. Jack, did you have... Anything you want I have, to? Excuse me, I've spoken with Police Chief Williams, Fire Chief McGoldrick, and the Code Enforcer Bruce Smith, and none of them had any concerns about the renewal and everything. Seems to be fine. Okay. Good. Move for passage. Okay, motion. Um, I'm going to first call on Councillor Fritz, who's going to recuse herself because she's a I'm shareholder. A holder, yeah. That's, that's okay. Do we have to vote? Um, the yes, we're supposed to. Okay, yes. so let's. I move that we accept Councillor Fritz's um, recusing herself from this issue. Second. All, any discussion? Further discussion? All in favor? Six, three, four, five. All opposed? One. Okay. Now, Councillor McGinty. I was going to move approval of the license. Okay, is there a second? Second. I'll second. <laughs> Any discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six. And zero. Opposed. Okay. Item 550304, consideration of a report from the use of facility staff working group. Um, and this is a report on the use of town facilities. Sue, are you here to provide some? Okay, okay. And now it's been recommended that this report be referred to a council workshop. So moved. Second. Okay. All in favor? Right. Questions? I'm sorry. Well, if we're going to have a, go ahead. I, I only wanted to say that I read through every single word of this document, and it is an excellently written document. And as a frequent user of the facilities, uh, I'm very proud that we have such facilities in our town and that Sue Weatherby does such a great job running them. And uh, this document really, really shows the, the good effort that they put into providing these services for the public. Okay. Thank you, Sue. <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> you mean you're going to object? I'd like to know why you want to add more work to your office. Actually, I just wanted to say it was entirely professional. It had a great 
cross-section of both school and, and town employees. Um, we did a lot of brainstorming. When the committee first convened, we thought, hmm, this will be three or four meetings, and it ended up being um, eight three to four hour meetings. So I, I, I just have to give credit to the committee. They did such a great job of playing the devil's advocate, um, coming up with every possible um, conflict there might be. So um, certainly, uh, I can't take the credit, but the committee deserves a big, great deal of credit, and it was just a great group to work with. So uh, um, hopefully they'll all be at the workshop to answer any questions you may have. Thank, thank you, and thank your group, please. Okay, so all in favor of setting this to a workshop? Six, seven, zero. Um, item 56004, consideration of proposed updates to the general assistance ordinance, and this is an annual thing that we do, updating the general assistance ordinance. Um, it's in your package, and it's recommended that a public hearing be scheduled for Monday, November 10th at 7.30, and I see the town manager wishing to discuss this further. Very brief. I wanted to make clear that, that this is usually a pro forma action. However, we are recommending that there be one uh, diversion from adopting the full MMA proposal, and that's as it relates to the housing maximum. Uh, by eliminating those, the housing maximum aren't really all that applicable to Cape Elizabeth, and by uh, eliminating those, we might be able to help some folks with some housing needs uh, that we might otherwise not be able to help. Okay. Uh, so can I have a motion? Councilor Roberts? I I'll move for passage passenger to refer it to public hearing. Second. 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 Any discussion, Councilor Roberts? <laughs> I would add uh, to what the, the town manager stated that the rent levels in this ordinance are ridiculously low, not just for Cape Elizabeth, for most of the greater Portland area. And I would hope that other communities would also take a look at what they're offering for help toward the rent, and we can lead the way. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor of setting this to public hearing? Seven zero. Okay, and it's that point in the meeting for citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. Seeing no citizens here, I will... Oh, I'm sorry, you are a citizen. Struck me at the beginning of the meeting, I was remiss in not making an annual announcement. Uh, every year we have a town uh, employee golf tournament, and it's hosted by the Pakuda Club at no expense to any of the golfers, at no expense to the town. Uh, the Pakuda Club provides the golf carts, and they also waive the green fee for the tournament. Uh, it's participated in by rescue members, by department members, public works, uh, police, fire, uh, community services, community services uh, members of the council, members of the town administration. And, uh, you know, we don't often accept anything gratis from anyone in the community. And this is, in fact, something that, that is accepted uh, as, as part of a, a team building activity, as part of a uh, uh, you know, wellness, but also as you know, a fun thing to do, admittedly. Uh, because of that, because we usually don't accept anything, I do always really wish to make sure that it's publicly disclosed, number one. Uh, number two, to thank the Prakutik uh, for hosting us. And number three, to thank the two hosts, uh, the two coordinators of the tournament, Dan Hannigan, who's a along with Paul Fireman and uh, Brent Sinclair, the police captain, and also to thank the Cape Elizabeth Police uh, Benevolent Association, the police union, uh, they fund all the trophies, and uh, it's just a great time, and appreciate uh, everyone's efforts to participate. And we have a little party at my house afterwards, which uh, is, is fun as well. And it was rained out uh, one day, but we rescheduled it, and food, it just uh, couldn't have been nicer. So I did want to use the citizens' discussion moment to uh, publicly acknowledge their work and disclose uh, uh, the fact that that uh, service is donated uh, for the enjoyment of those employees. Thank you, Michael. I just wanted to thank Michael for uh, hosting us at his home afterwards. We're not always happy campers when we show up. So. <laughs> <laughs> All 
Okay. Um, the next item on our agenda, item 570304, is consideration of entering executive session to discuss property land acquisition and disposition. And for the record, that is the discussion of the lot next to town hall. And we'll go, well, we will vote now whether or not to go into executive session. So move. Is there any discussion? I have, I have a question. Should we, should we mention whether we will be making any decisions at, after this executive session? Will, will there be we'll any be public votes? After? Well, will if, public if we make afterwards? any, thank you, that's good. If we make any decisions, we will come out of executive session and then there will be a public vote. I just wanted that note yeah. for the record. Yeah. Just so everybody is sure no, what's thanks. going on. So um, with that, we will go into executive session. One second. It won't be a final action. They'll still likely be subject to a further vote. That's right. And we need to vote. We need to vote. We didn't vote. Okay. Um, all in favor of going into executive session. Introduce us. I think seven zero. I'm sorry. I guess my mind is on the baseline. Too much, Thank you. Too much excitement. 